Well, good morning. Now, those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor David Oates. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and uh, it is a joy to, uh, to be here. And the very first thing that I want to do is I just, I really want to, uh, to, to just honor uh, the Lord for what he has given to us here in regard to staff and key uh, leadership volunteers within the life of our church. Um, the, the worship team that you have up here, and we've got, we, as a senior associate pastor, I get to work with the staff as a whole. And we have one of the finest staffs in the country. I mean, God is, I'm serious. We've just got some incredible men and women that give week in and week out. And it's not just our paid people. The Lord has given us an incredible volunteer team. I look over here, we got Jim and Sandra Carter. They rocked it out this weekend with their parenting seminar that took place here. I'm hearing lots of good stuff from, uh, from people. Some people were convicted. Who knew? All right. Um, I went through it, and I was convicted, so we're, <laughs> we're all good. Uh, but I want you to know that, that all of that starts at the top, and obviously with the Lord Jesus Christ, but it starts with our, our senior pastor. And God has given us a man who relationally cares for this, for our, our staff and the team. And so out of that and through his leadership, we have created this incredible culture. I mean, you talk to people that work here, and they go, man, I like working in this place. And I've worked at, uh, worked at other places where that's not true. It's harder to work at, uh, work at and I'll stop right there. Um, anyway, so I just want you to know that David Spiker's the real deal. I am grateful that he gets to lead, and I get to see him in his man cave, um, which he's got his own office off-site. So, uh, yeah, I won't go any more about that. And uh, in his office with his children, and he is authentic. He's real. And it all really flows out through that. So would you give the Lord a, just a clap offering for what God is doing in regard to the staff here? Okay. Well, I want to start off with just some repentance. That's, uh, this sermon is for me, and so if you get anything out of it, I'm very grateful. But uh, this last January, I hit the 20-year 20, 20 anniversary of doing full-time ministry. And looking back at the 20 years, there's some great things that I've celebrated with the Lord. I mean, there's literally thousands. I've seen thousands of people cross the line of faith and give their life to Jesus Christ. I've seen thousands of people get plugged into small groups and care groups. And um, I, have, I have watched marriages that were literally on the brink come back together. There's just been a lot of great fruit. But in the midst of all of that great fruit, sometimes God also gives you an opportunities to say, Hey, if you were going to do it different, or the next 20 years, what would you like to see differently? And there's an area in which God has shown me that I would like to do differently. I was reflecting um, on Matthew chapter 7. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's, Jesus starts the sermon in Matthew chapter 5, and he goes to Matthew chapter 7, and he ends the sermon. And as a preacher, you want to see the way Jesus ends the sermon, right? Right? So in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24 through 27, I notice the way that he lands the plane. You can flip there with me if you want. But it says this. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. And I remember going through this and thinking to myself, um, there's a whole group of people, Jesus preaches this message and I've always, as a little kid, I went to the place where build your life on the rock, right? You ever sing that song? Those of you who grew up in the church, you know what I'm talking about? And you don't want to build it on the sand because then it goes flat. God just spoke to my heart and said, there's two groups of people here. A group that hears and does, and a group over here who hears and doesn't do. It's not so much, you know, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's great, and it's a great song. But the issue is, are you a hearer and a doer, or are you a hearer and a not doer, right? And as I walked through 20 years of ministry, I realized 
one area that I have fallen short in, when I look back over the course, is I haven't made a lot of disciples. Um, thousands of people crossing the line of faith, but not a lot of disciples. People that look like Jesus and talk like Jesus and, and, and re reproduce themselves in other people. And if you know in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19, that was Jesus' key. He said, go and make disciples. disciples. So 20 years, and I'm going, ah, oh, I want to have more disciples in the next 20 years or until the Lord tarries his coming. And so that is what God has been working in my heart. I, I've been reading a book, and it really began to stir inside of me um, by Mike Breen. And it says this, you can build a church without making disciples, but you can't make disciples without building the church. That'll preach in and of itself. It's been a sermon that's constantly going off in my mind. You can build a church. There's lots of churches out there that open the doors and tons of people come in and, and, and they get to just, they're okay. It's great. Churches get big. But you can't make people that look like Jesus and not build the church. So, haven't we all been there? I mean, that's my personal journey, and so you can all just go, wow, ooh, those are some things David's working on. Good. But haven't we all been there a time or two? We hear a sermon, and we decide that we're going to do something differently, and then life creeps in, right? You ever been there? We become a hearer and not a doer of that word. We desire to put our faith in action, and then we take a look back over the next 5 or 10 or 15, or in my case, 20 years, and you go, well, there's some cool things that I'm doing, but those are some places that I'm missing the boat. I don't want to just be a hearer. I want to be a doer. So I want to ask this question for all of us. What did the early church, and I'm going to confess this at the, at the front end, if you try to stay tied to my notes, you're going to be frustrated, and I've been there at that time. So right now, if you want those, I will fill them in for you at the end. You can talk with me afterwards, but just put them down because don't want you to go there, okay? So some of you that A personality types are like, ah, he, hasn't, he missed the point. What in the world's going on? It's okay. What did the early church have that we lack? What did the early church have or didn't have that that we have and, and didn't have, right? There, there's a difference. Um, if we compare the early church and the church to today, there are some differences. The early church had no Bible. This did not exist. The early church had no conference centers, no hymnals, no life church, or, or no uh, life way. Ladies, ready for this? No Beth Moore. My goodness, what in the world? Um, no TV, no radio, and yet their enemies said they are unlearned, uneducated men, and they turned the world upside down. They did have the Holy Spirit, and they lived in such a way that the world, if you're filling in the blanks, that's one of your blanks there, was turned upside down with their teaching, but today, if we're honest about the church in America... The Christians are being turned upside down by the world. Am I preaching yet? And that affects all of us. I mean, when I look at America, and, and here's, here's the way the world does. They go, hey, America's a Christian nation. And it doesn't look a whole lot like Jesus. Back in the day, without all of those things, they had spiritual giants that turned the world upside down. And today, I look around and I see the church in America, and we have spiritual pygmies. The difference is colossal. How can we move beyond where we are in our walk with God? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Are we aiming at the right target? Well, God has something to say about that. One of the most interesting things that stands out to me is our focus as Americans on believing. America is, the American church is fascinated and wraps itself around believing. And did you know that the term believer is only used, you ready for this, drum roll, 
two times. Now, believe is used quite a few times, but when you refer to it as believer, it's only twice in the Bible. It's in Acts chapter 5, believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. 1 Timothy 4.12, let, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word and in conduct and love and spirit and faith and in purity. Only two times in the Bible is the word believers used. Now, believe... It's a great term. John 1.12 says, As many as believe in him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. But I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4, and verse 46. And we're going to take a snapshot, a picture of a man. And I'm going to tell the story, but we're going to see a man going through several stages of belief. It's a story of a, a nobleman living in Capernaum, and he hears rumors about this celebrated prophet, a preacher. He's continually going through the cities of Galilee and Judea, and he understands that this mighty preacher doesn't just capture the, the hearing through the sermons, but he wins the hearts through miracles, which he works to confirm the mission that he has he stores these things up in his heart. You know, a nobleman, he's kind of going, oh, I'll make a note of that. Sounds like a pretty interesting guy. But doesn't think much more about it until his son gets sick. And I want you to just think with me. Let's just say it's his only son. We don't know that for sure. But it's his dearly loved son, and all of a sudden he falls ill. And instead of him running around and scampering around, he's laying on his mat and his wife calls him in, and, and, and there's almost this fever breath that has been breathing on him, and his body is radiating heat. It's getting hotter and hotter. His cheeks are just will burn you to the touch, and they cannot lower his temperature no matter what. You see, as a nobleman, he has some means. And so he calls the, the local doctors together, and he says, Guys, come in, please, help my son. And they come in, and... Several of them look, and they all have the same diagnosis. They look the parent in the eyes, and they say, the situation's hopeless. As a parent, you don't want to hear that. Hopeless. And immediately, his mind goes back to this man named Jesus, and, and he's returned to Cana. He did his first miracle there, which is he turned water into wine. Come on. You know that there's some people already going, hey, we can start a Jesus brewery going on here, right? It's like just water and bam, insto, presto, Jesus. And so word had gotten out. And Jesus had come back to Canaan, and he's 25 miles away. And we see he enters that first stage of belief. We're going to look at these three different stages right here. And he says, is it possible I've lost all hope with the doctors. 25 miles away, there's a man named Jesus, and possibly he could help my son. So he makes his way there. And by this point, his son is, is at the point of death. Death has not just put its finger on him, it's pierced, and it's right up at the heart. He's literally just moments away from dying. And so he makes his way as quickly as he can and he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, my son is dying. Please come. And Jesus challenges him. I mean, when you read the Bible and you see what he says, you go, whoa, Jesus, this seems pretty harsh. Listen to what he says. He says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will no means believe. The man, however, pays little regard to the rebuke, for there's a desire which has absorbed all of the powers of his soul. His mind is so overwhelmed with one anxiety that he is oblivious to everything else besides it. Sir, he said, sir, come down, please, before my child dies. His faith has now arrived at such a point that he pleads in prayer and earnestly asks the Lord to come and to heal his son. At this point, the master looks with an eye of compassion and says, go your way, your son lives. The father goes his way cheerfully, quickly, contently, trusting in the word, which has yet no evidence to confirm. He's now reached the second 
stage of faith. He's come from the seeking stage to the second stage of faith, which is the relying stage. He stops crying and pleading for something that he does not have, and he trusts and believes that what he seeks has been given to him, even though he still not received the gift. You see, in this day and age, they didn't have, they didn't have these beauties. I mean, 25 miles, to put it in perspective, it takes you as long for him to go 25 miles as it, for, as, as it does for us to get to the other side of the world with our modern conveniences and airplanes and things like that. Literally, he, was, he couldn't pick up the phone and go, honey, how's he doing? Nope, didn't have that. So he had to look at Jesus, hear what he said, and say, okay, I'm content. And I've moved from that seeking belief to the relying belief that what Jesus just said is true. And he turned and made his way home. I want you to see that he, he's making his way back and all of a sudden these servants meet him on the road and they're so excited. They're like, you wouldn't believe it. The fever broke. What the doctor said wasn't true. And they said, when exactly did that happen? And he said, oh, it happened at this such and such an hour. And he lined it up and he said, it was exactly the moment when Jesus said it. My friends, he moved to another stage of belief. At that moment, he came into the third stage. And he walked into the room. And instead of seeing his son lying on a mat, literally at the point of death, his son leaps into his arms, looks into his eyes and says, Oh, Daddy! His heart is just overjoyed. And he's actually tasting the fruit of the belief that he's had up to this point. My friends, I would say to you that he moved from just believing to becoming a disciple. Because it was at this point in his life that not only does he believe, but he brings his family together and he says, Guys, let me tell you something. We are now going to worship Jesus because we put our trust and our belief in him. And when you see somebody that actually starts passing that on and reproducing themselves, you've moved to another stage in that belief process. You see the three stages, the seeking stage of belief. And again, I celebrate belief. We had 59 people over Easter come and put red cards on, their, on the cross saying, I believe. I'm walking across the line of faith. Whoa. Yes, that's exciting. But I don't want to leave you there. God wants us as South Bay. God is calling us together, me specifically, these next 20 years. God, when we move from believing to becoming something far more, something called disciples. That's the other term. Now, I want you to, we talked a little bit about the fact that how many times is the word believer used in the New Testament? Two times. So this other word, disciple, I mean, is that a big deal? Is that what God wants? Well, let's, let's talk about how often it's, it's mentioned. Um, the Bible uses the word disciple 72 times in the book of Matthew. 46 times, it's the blank if you're filling it in. 46 times in the book of Mark. 38 times in the book of Luke, 77 times in the book of John, 30 times in the book of Acts, over 263 times is this word disciple mentioned in the New Testament. The difference between believers and disciple is pretty huge. And I want to, for all of us, I want us to be yearning together to move beyond believing. What is a believer? Let's define it to start off with. A believer is a baby Christian. If you're just a believer, you're a beautiful believer, but you're an infant. It's just like when you were born. Praise God, infants are beautiful, but they're infants, which means that they don't do anything except for cry and they take. That's what they do. They're really good at taking. And I had four children, and I went through that stage. And bless God, I'm not glad I'm not in that stage any longer. Some of you are in that stage, and bless, your, bless the Lord. We had celebration parties when our kids got out of diapers. It was like, there's more money in the house for us to do something else with than wipe somebody's bottom. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Babies can't do anything. 
They're takers. They need someone to clean up after them. Babies make work. They don't contribute. Pastors and spiritual leaders in the church change spiritual diapers. That's what God has called us to do. Believers know, now check this out, believers know a truth, they don't know the truth. We've all been beautiful babies, but we all need to continue to grow up. That's God's heart and desire for us. So what is a disciple? A discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. A disciple is someone who, with increasing intentionality and the passing of time, has a life and ministry that looks more and more like the life and the ministry of Jesus. Disciples increasingly have Jesus' heart and character and are able to do the things that Jesus did. Now, listen to me. There's a huge lie out there. Some of you all of a sudden are starting to turn me off because you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. David, you're setting the bar here at Jesus. Listen to me. Jesus went to fishermen in Galilee. And he said, these are just average, average guys. And he said, you can be like me. If you have said yes to Jesus, I am telling you today, we can be like him. I am so glad that Jesus is about the average I mean, when you got the, the guy at the top, very top of the class, the 1%, he speaks 85 languages. Praise God for those people. I'm not one of them, right? I have a dear friend who's like that. He's like, yeah, I was down in South America for about six months, and I, I picked up the language, and we were in Mexico at the time, and, and I was preaching, and he said, yeah, I think I can translate for you. The guy translates for me after just living in South America. Yeah, I picked up German. I was over there working for Mercedes-Benz for six months, and I'm like, What? Praise God for those people. And if you're one of those, praise God for you. I'm glad. But I'm not like that. God's about taking average people. And the enemy wants to come along and say, hey, you can never be like Jesus. That's way too high. But then, then you're, you're missing the point because Jesus said you could be like him. Jesus said that you could be like him. So, we don't have to look very far in the New Testament to see this happening. Jesus looked at the life of the disciples and the apostles and the community that they led, and over time they looked more and more like him. How did the church go, listen to this, for 120 people in an upper room to more than 50% of the Roman Empire in the course of 250 years, and they didn't have one of these? Simple. They had a way of reproducing the life of Jesus in disciples in real flesh and blood people who were able to do the things that we read about Jesus doing in the Gospels. And these disciples did these things on purpose. Do you understand? These people didn't have the modern conveniences that we have today. And yet their lives were transformed to such a way that, that God, that, that, that their enemies said, they're unlearned, uneducated people, but I can tell that they've been with Jesus 250 years, Christianity is non-existent. Half the Roman Empire falls in love with Jesus. There's a major disconnect between the world and the way that God has called us to be, the lack that we see in America today and what the early church had. So are you a believer or are you a disciple? Oftentimes we can think that disciples belong to another age. Maybe this is the reason why the church has lost its punch. How do we become disciples? Well, I'm glad that you asked. If you flip over with me to John chapter 8 and verse 31. There's a key verse. And we get to see what, how God unfolded this. It says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. These were believers. Everybody say believers. believers. Okay. If you abide in my word, you are my, what's the next word? Disciples. Disciples. Indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And I want you to notice, you shall know the truth. 
not a truth, the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Today's a lot about confession for me. Like I said, if you get something out of this, great, because God's been working me over. Um, I have discovered that I am, I've been dehydrated. I have not been drinking enough water on a consistent basis. And uh, I've, I was reading a website recently saying, you know, have you ever been, de have you ever been dehydrated? Um, and I've realized that I've lived mildly dehydrated a lot, and so I'm trying to really increase my water intake. If you're at 2% dehydration, here's some of the symptoms. Um, one experiences thirst and discomfort, loss of appetite, dry skin, followed by constipation. Don't mean to be disgusting. Athletes may suffer a loss of performance of up to 30% and a rapid onset of fatigue. That's how I would know. I would get a perfectly good night's sleep, and I'd be going, and about the middle of the afternoon, all of a sudden, I'd be like, Grrr. So I don't know if you've ever been there, and I'm like, what's going on, man? And, I'm, and, and I would try to fill it with food. And I realized, no, I'm dehydrated. I need to drink more water. A 3 to 4% dehydration symptoms become undeniable. One experience decreased urine volume, unexplained tiredness, irritability, lack of tears when crying, and in some cases, insomnia. Shown to negatively impact people's moods, including confusion, fatigue, and negative moods. Now, none of you guys can use this on your spouse. It's like, hey, honey, I think you might need a glass of water. <laughs> That becomes code in our house for, <laughs> why don't you check and see what's going on? <laughs> um, so a, a 5 to 6% loss of water, one becomes groggy or sleepy, experiences headaches or nausea, feels tingling in one's limbs. A 10 to 15% fluid loss, muscles become spastic, skin becomes shriveled, wrinkled, vision, urination will be greatly reduced, may be painful, delirium may begin. Uh, losses of water of greater than 15% are usually fatal. Listen to me, Jesus says that I'm the living water. I want to challenge you because I think that a lot of us are spiritually dehydrated. God is saying, come, Jesus says, come drink from me. I, I want to give you water that, that and, and this isn't about dissecting something in the word of God. This is about coming to him as a love letter and saying, oh God, I love you. I long for you to just make yourself known in my life. God wants to reveal himself. So how do we, how do we all together do this? How are disciples made? What's, what's the challenge? Well, I'm glad that you asked, because I've been thinking a lot about that as I've been praying for our church. Or Matthew 19 says, Go, therefore, and make disciples. Lord, thanks for those disciples I've made along the journey, but oh God, I want to make more. You see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to actually make believers. We, we get to, blessed are those that bring the good news, but the Holy Spirit makes them. But he calls us, every one of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, to make disciples. That's our job. Disciples aren't just made, in, they're not made in the classroom. You can hear some great things, but I want to show you on the back of your paper, if you've got that, we're going to put this up here as well, how Jesus did this and how we're going to land the plane. I've got a graph, and this graph sums it up. Plus, I've got two of your blanks right there. So those of you who are just, just relax, it's okay. The very top is high invitation. High invitation to relationship. And I want you to know the American church has nailed this. We got greeters at every church in America. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. Come on in. We're going to love you. It's awesome. Then you got the low invitation, and there's churches out there, I guess, like that. <laughs> We don't care if you show up or not. <laughs> That's not us. On the other side, you got low challenge. That, now, if you got low invitation and low challenge, that's the boring quadrants. Just, 
Come on, we're glad that you're here, right? Apathetic culture. Now you move over to the other side, and you've got a high challenge, but low invitation. It's not about love at all. But we're going to make sure you do something. Stressful quadrant. Woo! I don't want to be a part of a church like that. Now here's where I lived. I asked my kids. This was really convicting. I go, how does dad come across in, in the spiritual realm? And, and it's really hard to disciple your kids when you're a pastor because you don't want to feel like you're just shoving it down their, their throats, Right? And so there's times when, spiritually speaking, I, I, cre- I try to create environments, but I don't want to be there. Did you memorize the verses? I gave you Leviticus, the whole book, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I don't want to be that dad, right? So I'm talking to my daughter, and she, she's looking at these quadrants, and she says, yeah, Dad, oftentimes, spiritually speaking, you're in the chaplaincy quadrant. You're high invitation. I mean, I'm inviting my kids to everything all the time. You'll ask them. I'm like, hey, we're going to go pray at 5 in the morning. You want to get up? <laughs> We pray right here, 6 o'clock. It's great. But that challenge aspect is where Jesus lived. That's the discipling quadrant. It's the empowering quadrant. And if you look at Jesus' life, you look at the Sermon on the Mount, he said things like this. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. He had a man that comes up to him and says, hey, um, what must I do to be saved? When people come up to me and say, what must I do to be saved? You know what I do? I look them right in the eyes and I say, oh, Dude, let me tell you, you just need to bow your head and let's, let's accept Jesus and what he did. You know what, what happened when Jesus was asked that? He said, listen, this is what I want you to do. Go sell everything that you have and come and follow me. Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> high challenge, high invitation. And it's in that quadrant that disciples are made. My confession to you, 20 years looking back, I've been too much of a chaplain. I promise you, the way that God has wired me, I'm, I'm bent towards, I'm going to be the high invitation. I'm going to love you. It's just in me. But I'm praying, God, would you disciple me in such a way that as people come to me that I wouldn't just love them, but I'd say hard things to them. Because I don't, wanna, I don't want you to like me, I want you to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I want people to come into my life and and challenge me so that I become more like him. And I want you to know that you can be more like him. It was recently that I was talking to somebody and they were talking about our care, equip, and send. And they're like, dude, what a marketing tool you got at your church. You guys are a church of care, equip, and send. That's awesome. And I went, and I turned pale white. I was like, uh, it's not a marketing tool. I want you to understand why we care, we equip, we send. Because Jesus cared and equipped and sent. And we want to be like Jesus. If you think those three words, apart from Jesus, it's a, it's a country club. It's something else. It's not what we're doing here. And so all of us together, God wants us to be a disciple. And if you accepted, you're one of the 59 people and you said yes to Jesus... Praise God. Amen. But I want you to know it's not the end game. God wants more for every single one of us. And so I want to invite you to that. So if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes with me. First of all, if you're sitting there and you're new to the church and You're saying, wow, this whole stuff about Jesus, I I don't even know that I'm a believer. I'm not even that first stage yet. I want today to be the day of salvation for you. And so I want to just give you an opportunity, and it's it's a low bar in in the fact that Jesus, he already did it all. He he went to the cross, he died for you, he was buried, he rose again, and he said, whoever believes on my name, you can become a child of God. And I'm going to invite you that today can be your day and you can start the most amazing adventure ever. So if you're sitting there and you realize I haven't done that, would you just in the quietness of your heart say, Father, I believe in what Jesus did and I'm giving him my life. I'm giving you my life right now. Take my sin, 
<clears throat> I exchange my life for yours. Come into my life. Forgive me. Make me the man or the woman that you want me to be. And Jesus will come. If you prayed that, would you just slip your hand up? I just want to know. I've got some people that just want to be able to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> assume here for a moment the rest of you, you're already believers. You're on that three stage. And I want to ask that you would <clears throat> pray a prayer with me and invite the Lord to challenge you to a greater degree than you've been challenged before. <clears throat> that you'd move from a cozy culture or wherever you've been in regard to that to a discipling culture. So if that's you, just in the quietness of your heart as I pray out loud, just say, Heavenly Father, would you make me a disciple? I, I cast out fear that tells me I can't do it. I accept the Holy Spirit and the fact that you said that I could. And Lord, I ask that you would begin to bring some challenges into my life so I can reproduce people that look like you. That I can begin to look more like you. If you prayed that prayer, would you just look at me? Thank you. Thanks. Father, you, you, you've heard the cries that have taken place in this room. Make South Bay a discipleship culture. So when you come back, you can say, oh, that was my church. That's South Bay. They got people that look like me. They're turning the world upside down. Tampa's different because that church exists. God, we can only do that by the power of your Holy Spirit. Would you descend? Would you challenge and walk with us? Would you walk with me? so that when this life is over, we have no regrets. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Everybody said. Amen. If you need prayer, you can come up to the front. <clears throat>